Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, Robbie, you've heard Democrats argue that a vote for Biden is a vote to save democracy, but it seems increasingly clear that authoritarianism in America is a bipartisan project. A TikTok ban just passed the House with a vote of 352 to 65 and is being fast-tracked in what might be one of the most extreme abridgments of speech in American history. The government banning a media forum and granting itself the power to do so with any app deemed to be owned by foreign adversaries. With a vote tally like that, you might expect that a broad swath of the public supports this policy, but you'd be wrong. A poll conducted last month shows that only 31 percent of adults favor a TikTok ban. A full 73 percent of people who actually use TikTok oppose the ban. So why? Why then is this happening? Well, let's start by talking about what they say their motives are. Establishment politicians are trying to sell this mass censorship campaign by couching it in terms of national security interest. Listen to this dystopian quote a political scientist at Cornell's Tech Policy Institute gave to Business Insider yesterday. Quote, framing this as a national security threat offers the government considerable latitude when it comes to First Amendment questions. Now, ask yourself, do we want the government to have considerable latitude when it comes to First Amendment questions? We have seen this playbook before. We saw it in 2016 when Russian disinformation was allegedly behind Hillary's loss. And we saw it in 2020 when the mainstream media claimed Putin was boosting Bernie Sanders and that Hunter Biden's laptop was Russian interference, banning the story from Twitter as it broke. Meanwhile, similar concerns were not raised about mainstream media's misinformation campaigns, be it their credulous embrace of the Steele dossier, Russiagate, or the suppression of lob leak theory. One might almost come to the conclusion that it's not misinformation itself that's the target, but certain ways of thinking, certain ideas that are under attack. And I believe you'd be right. Yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that lawmakers are targeting TikTok because they're losing the public opinion battle over Palestine. According to the Post, some lawmakers complained that TikTok appeared to favor pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel content and renewed calls to ban the app in the U.S. after October 7th. Illinois Democrat Raja Krishnamurthy, who has been working on the bill for months, told the Post, quote, October 7th really opened people's eyes to what's happening on TikTok. A fresh wave of concern about what people are allowed to say on social media, where establishment gatekeepers are disempowered, started to percolate in the weeks following October 7th, and gruesome imagery of nearly 1,200 Israelis killed on that day were overwhelmed by a nonstop torrent of carnage out of Gaza. First, videos of shelled cities and bombing campaigns went viral. Kids calling out from under rubble, unable to be retrieved because of Israel's blockade. Later, IDF soldiers posting their own content, planned demolitions of housing blocks and universities, women's underwear pilfered from the drawers of Palestinian women whose fates were unknown, dinners cooked in Palestinian homes while Gazans starved. These images went viral for all the wrong reasons. And one way to stop them from circulating broadly is to do what many corporate outlets have done and to simply ignore them. Alternatively, you can go to the source, go to the platform. Now, Vox reported back in mid-December that during the preceding month, TikTok's CEO, Xu Chu, met with executives at the Anti-Defamation League, as well as execs at Tinder and Facebook to discuss moderation and, here's that word again, misinformation. TikTok's head of operations met virtually with prominent pro-Israel influencers like Amy Schumer and Sasha Baron Cohen, who reportedly accused TikTok of, quote, creating the biggest anti-Semitic movement since the Nazis. American Congress members have accused TikTok of promoting pro-Palestinian content as part of a secret Chinese agenda. Josh Howley, who supports a Twitter ban, tweeted that TikTok was a Chinese spy engine and a, quote, purveyor of virulent anti-Semitic lies. And Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee offered a similar take, saying, quote, it would not be surprising that the Chinese-owned TikTok is pushing pro-Hamas content. An audio file was leaked last week of ADL head Jonathan Greenblatt lamenting a, quote, major, major generational problem. 
citing polling showing that young people are not supportive of Israel's siege. Quote, we really have a TikTok problem, a Gen Z problem, he said. We need to put our energy towards this, like, fast. It gets worse. The effort to restrict your right to make negative judgments about Israel's policies is increasingly being codified into law, sometimes under the guise of prohibitions against anti-Semitism. A new South Dakota law requires the state's Human Rights Enforcement Division to use the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism, which deems it anti-Semitic to, quote, claim the state of Israel is a racist endeavor or compare, quote, contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Hmm, something Sasha Baron Cohen just did when talking to TikTok. If that seems overly broad to you, it is. Note that the Oscar-winning Jewish director of Zone of Interest, Jonathan Glazer, did exactly this on Monday night when he used his acceptance speech to warn the world not to repeat the tragic dehumanization of the past. As it turns out, the Anti-Defamation League, which, remember, lobbied TikTok with concerns about pro-Palestine content, called Glazer's comments both factually incorrect and morally reprehensible. If Glazer had given that speech in South Dakota, his comments might have had legal consequences. For years, long before October 7th, but decades into the illegal occupation of Palestine, Holocaust survivors have compared Zionist policies to Nazi policies. But according to the Christian governor of a state with fewer than 400 Jewish Americans living there, that's anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, South Dakota is not an edge case. Several similar anti-Semitism laws are making their way through the legislatures of at least three states. And as you'll recall, the House voted last December to pass a resolution explicitly conveying anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. It passed 311 to 14. Again, a bipartisan effort. And that's not all. The Intercept reported this week that the Department of Homeland Security is expanding its reach on college campuses under the guise of fighting foreign malign influence, in this case, Hamas. In a December 11th report to ousted Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas, Homeland Security's, quote, Academic Partnership Council advised that DHS coordinate with campus law enforcement and school resource officers and, quote, immediately address gaps and disconnects in information sharing. Last November, Mayorkas wrote that a DHS slash academic partnership will fight the introduction of, quote, ideas and perspectives by foreign governments that America thinks oppose U.S. interest. The Intercept's reporting notes that DHS behaved similarly after 9-11. An ACLU lawsuit showed that DHS was monitoring anti-war groups on campus and slipping that information to the Department of Defense. Imagine the government spying on your child because you raised a compassionate being who objects to what the International Court of Justice has called a plausible genocide in Gaza. Luckily, there is some resistance to this authoritarian overreach. Libertarian Rand Paul has consistently opposed the ban, as have some progressive caucus members, like Robert Garcia, who pointed out that a ban would negatively impact both freedom of expression and the economy. Progressive caucus chair emeritus Mark Pocan was so unimpressed by the Biden administration's TikTok briefing yesterday that he went from being open to the ban to being a no. It's very big brotherish, he said, according to NBC's Sahil Kapoor. And he's right. As Michael Tracy argued in Newsweek yesterday, it's little more than a power grab for the deep state. The only thing I would add to Tracy's account is that TikTok's just the tip of the iceberg. Well, it won't surprise you to learn that I substantively agree, um, uh, particularly on the policy. I've said many times that I oppose this. I will likely have my own um, radar on it tomorrow, that, making the, certainly the same overall point that this is a naked power grab. Um, look, if people want to raise concerns or point out concerns with TikTok or any other social media app, I, I think they're free to do that. I do not trust the Chinese government to have a benign influence on the company, just as I do not trust the U.S. government to have a benign influence on Facebook and Twitter, because I've seen, we've seen firsthand what governments do um, yeah. or have tried to do to social media companies. So this is not, from my perspective, about being overly, you know, uh, uh, forgiving or naive about um, the effects China can have on the company. All that said, 
Do we respond by empowering our own government to decide which kind of content, which types of content people, millions of young people, can see? That seems so obviously wrong. And, and, I, I, and I would warn, particularly Republicans who are you know, cheering this right now, to think about what if a, a Democratic administration designates Twitter or Facebook as a as a foreign as a you know too much Russian influence that kind of thing? There are many Democrats and mainstream pundits who literally think that that's why Donald Trump won in 2016. What would they do with that same same power? And I was happy to see um, I, I was not happy to see the House pass right. this bill, but in dissent, voting against it were um, some of. Who the mainstream will deride as the craziest members of Congress, but who we think, you know, often bring interesting contrarian perspectives. Your your Thomas Masseys, your Nancy Maces, your Matt Gateses, and then many of your progressive AOCs, Presley, uh, uh, Pope a reassuring Man, member of them, right? I mean, fifty of them, yeah. But so I was frankly surprised to discover that there were more people on the Democratic side of the aisle that came out in, in objection to this, and there have been conservatives, especially because I think the conservatives have been louder and more consistent well, in their objections Donald to Trump, this bill. Donald Trump, Elon Musk, Musk, and Tucker Carlson all came out against this bill. Yeah, well, it is important to note that, of course, Donald Trump started the campaign to ban TikTok back when he was president, and this is a flip-flop of source. It's a welcome flip-flop, but I do think it's worth having some skepticism about whether or not this is a pure political play or whether it's something he would actually back off of if he were president yeah. again. Well, we shall see, maybe, <laughs> perhaps. More rising right after this.